Here's the explanation of the evangelism. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're only going to deal with verse 18 and 19 today. And then I'm going to talk about the joy of evangelism next week. So here's verse 18. The Bible says this. This is the New Living Translation. And all of this. So we're in the midst of a context that Paul is conveying to the Corinthian church. He says, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task. So if you have been brought back to God through Christ, you have a task. What is it? Reconciling people to him. Do y'all see how that flows? If I have been brought back to God, which is a ministry of reconciliation, if I've been brought back to God, I have one task to do in my life, and that is reconcile other people to him. Does that make sense? So verse 19, he says, for God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. See, y'all should have blew the roof off this place right there. Watch this. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave them, watch this, this wonderful message of reconciliation. So our job, I can, I can say this right here, we can go home. Our job is to go tell people that Jesus showed up so that your sins no longer count against you. That's our job. But I can't stop there. That, they, they won't allow me to do that. So here we go. Verse 20, just for contextual purposes, I'm going to read this. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the sin offering for our sin, or to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. I just want to talk to you about the explanation of evangelism. All right? So here we go. I'm going to use the same word a lot. So don't, don't mind. Here we go. Evangelism. This is what it is. It is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ in word and deed. That's evangelism. Evangelism was never meant to be by word alone. But evangelism was meant to be heard and it's meant to be seen. So a lot of times, before people can hear the word, they have to see the word. That's where, that's where the struggle comes in, is because of the fact that we want people to hear the word, but we never want people to see the word. You have to, you have to act like God before people can accept your words about God. Does that make sense? Evangelism. It is a fundamental and a dynamic aspect of Christianity that plays a pivotal role in spreading faith, belief, and spiritual teaching. Evangelism. It's fundamental. It's, it's dynamic. Evangelism is rooted in the, in the Latin term evangelium, which means good news or gospel. Everybody has a task in, in word and deed to spread the good news or the gospel. Everybody has that task, right? So then evangelism then is the practice of sharing the message of Jesus with others inviting them to embrace Jesus and encouraging them to embark upon a transformative spiritual experience with Jesus the Christ. That's evangelism, right? So we all knew that. I understand that. But let me, let me, let me, let me go a little further than this. I want to take you a little further. Evangelism is an endeavor that calls for us to bear witness to the transformative power of Jesus Christ. So think about that. We are, as saved people, we are called to showcase the transformative power of Jesus to other people in our life. It is our job to show people the power of God through us. 
Does that make sense? All right. So then evangelism then is not a mere obligation. It is a sacred calling that beckons us to step out of our comfort zone and into the world around us. Why is that? Because Jesus has transformed our life. So what does that mean, Jeremy? It suggests that if God has done anything in your life, it is on you to step outside of your comfort zone and tell the world about it. Does that make sense? So that means then that if God has, woke, has, has, has allowed you to wake up in the morning, you ought to tell somebody about it. If God has put a roof over your head, you ought to tell somebody about it. Why? Because God is doing things in your life that needs to be shouted to the rooftop. So now... What that, what that leads us to is that it leads us to understanding that evangelism is an invitation to become living testimonies of our belief in Jesus, to be a torch barrier uh, for hope, compassion, and salvation. This is what the world is missing. They're missing hope, they're missing compassion, and they're missing salvation. We as a body of Christ need to become the torch barrier for hope, compassion, and salvation. When people find God, stuff changes. Does that make sense? Yeah, nod your head if that makes sense. All right, all right, I'm good. I'm on, I'm on the page then. So here's the reality then. Evangelism then is not an ancient practice. Stop saying it. It's not an ancient practice. But it is a living and a breathing testament to our enduring, to our, uh, enduring commitment to God and to the unsaved creation. We as a body of Christ have to be committed to the unsaved. I knew I was going to get seven right there. I I knew that. I knew that. But that's okay. We have to be committed to the unsaved. So what does that mean, Jeremy? That what that should tell you is, is that evangelism is not encouraging members of other churches to attend yours. Does that make sense? It is not saying to someone else who goes to another, hey, you should come to my church because, man, we got an awesome preacher. We got an awesome, that ain't, that, ain't, oh, man, listen, y'all getting ready to work me up already and I ain't even know you. Look, so what that suggests is, is that we are only focused on people who know the Lord. When the sole objective of the Christian is to focus on people who don't know who God is. That's evangelism. We're not about, can I say this without getting in trouble? We're not about, we're not about swell in growth. We don't want swell. Swelling sometimes hurts. You get all these other people from other places and they're coming into one place and that's an amazing thing until we figure out that everybody that we recruited over here know the Lord like I know the Lord and there's still the unsaved out there that we still have yet to concern ourselves with. Before you go and ask somebody else who attends another church of Christ to come here, ask somebody who don't know God to come here. That's what we should be doing. Evangelism is not encouraging others who know God. It's encouraging people who don't know God so that they can come into contact with his transformative power. Does that make sense? All right. Evangelism has everything to do with the unsaved population who still needs to hear about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So here's the first Mason moment for all of my kids with praise packs. I need you to write this down. I need you to write this down. It's simply this. As a Christian, one of our top priorities should be investing much thought in how can we get the lost to know who Jesus is. That should be one of the top priorities that we have as children of the kingdom. How can I uh, word, how can I live, how can I be an example so that people who don't know God will know God because of what I say or because of what I do? Let me tell you something. You want to run somebody away from knowing God. It's not about what you say. 
It's about what you do. Because people are watching save people and realize that the world we live in today that's watching save people, they are watching you to find fault so they can say, see, I told you about them church folk. I told you. But you know what, though? What I found is, is that we set ourselves up for that. We did. We did that. But now it's all about, it's all about trying to undo what we did so that people will know, hey, I am saved because I'm not perfect. Everybody in here should have nod your head. Yeah, I'm saved because I'm not perfect. If I was perfect, I wouldn't have needed Jesus. But because I am not a perfect person, I needed to know who Jesus was. Imperfection needed to get to know perfection so that we could be covered by perfection. So that when God looks at us, he doesn't see the imperfection and the flaws of man. But he sees the blood of Jesus, which now God looks at, at us as if we are perfect. Isn't that good stuff? That's good stuff. It's okay. All right, here we go. I hope I gave it enough time for them to write that down. All right, so here we go. As we pick up in the middle of the context, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're picking up in the middle of this context. The key idea is reconciliation. And because of our rebellion, I want to walk us through this really quickly. We were enemies of God and out of fellowship with him. Okay, so this is where we are in the middle of this context. Paul is talking about reconciliation, and he's trying to let us know, look, we were once enemies of God. We were rebellious against God. We had no fellowship with God. And it's through the work of the cross that has brought man and God back together again. So one of the things that I love about that is that the basic meaning of the the word reconciliation is to change Thoroughly, When we come back to God, not only are we no longer enemies of God, but we are literally, uh, we are literally sons and daughters of the king. That's how you change thoroughly. In essence, what Paul is trying to show us is that your status changes when you come back to God. Because of the cross, there is a change relationship between God and God. And the lost world. Let me put a plug in here. God never stopped loving us even when we were rebellious against him. He never stopped. And think about how amazing that is. All it takes is for people to look at us wrong and we change the way we feel. Maybe that ain't y'all. Maybe I'm in the wrong room. (laughs) All it takes is for people to say something we don't like and it changes the way that we feel. But with God, we looked at him wrong. We did him dirty. We told him that we, we didn't want nothing to do with him. We told him that don't, don't you come around us no more. God, we are enemies with you. God, if we could fight, we would fight. And God says, I still love you anyway. How amazing is that? I'm glad that God does not treat me how some of y'all treat me. No, I'm just joking. I'm joking. All right. I'm just joking. I'm joking. Listen, listen. God himself begun the work. That's what this should tell you. God, he he started the work. Only God can allow people to approach him. Only God can satisfy his own righteous demands. And only God can save. Notice how all of that goes. Only God, only God, only God, only God. So that means that if when our status changed, it was only because of God. We tried to change our own status. We tried, we tried, we tried, and we couldn't get there. That's why the law was there. The law was there to show us that your status cannot be changed by you. But the law showed us that we needed some extra help. And so God, 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 God changes everything. That's why you serve the God that you serve, because he is a God who can change everything. Does that make sense? This is the message of evangelism that we should be sharing with those who know not God. That God started it. God was involved with it. God made it, made it happen. God gave the ability. And God is still working on each and every one of us every single day of our life. Which means that it leaves us no room to take credit for everything that God is working on. I have no room. I can't take no credit because it had nothing to do with me. It's all God. It's all God started. It's all God led. And one of the things that I love about it is that it's going to be God finished. 
He's going to do everything. I just got to step into what God wants. So here's the message that I need to relay is that when you trust in Christ, you are no longer an enemy of God, but you are a son or daughter. That's who you are. Through the self-sacrificial work of Jesus, God has made believers part of his family. Why can't we go share this message? God did everything. Now all you got to do is step into this and God will make you a part of the family. I would rather be in the family and it be God led than be out of the family and me be in control. I make too many mistakes to be in control. And maybe, maybe some of y'all don't make as many mistakes that I make. All right, that's cool. No, no worries. But you still make them. And so I would rather be in the family of God and be led than to be outside of the family of God trying to do the leading. Okay? So I need, I need to share this. I need to share this. Because believers have been reconciled to God, we have privilege of encouraging others to accept God's free gift. Notice I underline the word privilege. Italicize the word privilege, meaning that this is not something that we automatically have. This is something that God gave us as a privilege for us to go and share what's happened to us. It is our privilege because it's not something that we deserve. It's not something that we earn. It's something that was given. And God says, what I gave, I'm going to give you the privilege to go share. Because this don't belong to you. Are y'all, are y'all seeing that? This does not belong to you. Salvation was not for us because of our status, but when God changed our status, he says, now you have the privilege of going out and sharing. We should look at evangelism not as an, not as an obligation, but as a privilege. It's a privilege to go and talk about God. Because when you recognize how great God is, you recognize all the things that God does, you recognize the power that is within God, you recognize that God is this grand, this grand spirit who controls everything. We literally don't understand how good we have it because of how, of how uh, normal we try to make God. But let me tell you something, God is greater, and this is going to blow your mind, but God is greater than anything that you can imagine. And we have a privilege of speaking on his behalf. Think about that. All the sin in your life, you still have the privilege of speaking on behalf of God. That's that's a good thing for me. It's a good thing for you. Because when you are a child of God, you have been called to the ministry of reconciliation or you have been called to evangelism. And since Paul experienced reconciliation through Jesus, it became his mission to preach Romans 5, which simply suggests, for if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? We have an opportunity that we cannot let go by. And the church owes it to the world to keep spreading the message of reconciliation. We owe this to them. We owe this to the unsaved to go and share with them that we were all once enemies with God. And now he sent Jesus so that we no longer have to be enemies, but now we can be free. We owe this. And because we don't take our obligation seriously, because we look at it as an obligation instead of a privilege, instead of us taking uh, the privilege seriously, we look at it more as an obligation. And now we wonder why the world is the way that it is. It's because we don't have enough people saying, God, I'm going to take responsibility and accountability for the privilege that you've placed within me and I'm going to share. Some of us, 
We do great with it. Some of us, we struggle with this. Some of us, we are, we are trying to figure out if we're, if we're in or we're out. But God says, look, everything that I've done, the least you can do for me is share. That's the least you can do is share. That's the least. So watch this. All right, here we go. I'm good. Verse 19. So that was verse 18 within a nutshell. Now, verse 19 provides for us the explanation of evangelism or the ministry of reconciliation. For God, this is verse 19, the New Living Translation, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer uh, counting people's sins against them. This is the wonderful message that he has given us to tell other people, right? So let's, let's look at this very quickly from an educational standpoint. The word counting there in that text is the Greek word uh, logazomai, which means it speaks about calculating the debt of a person. So what Paul is saying here is that before Jesus came about, our debts were being tallied and totaled and calculated and God was keeping record of everything that we were doing. But now that Jesus has come and he's died on the cross, when God says, I will forget their sins and I will remember them no more, he really means that. God says, I'm no longer going to keep tallying their sins. I'm no longer going to keep counting their sins. But God says, because Jesus came, everybody gets a clean slate. But you want to know what's good about God? The slate that we got today is not going to look like the slate that we get tomorrow. And the slate we get tomorrow is not going to look like the slate that we get the next day. Because I believe Lamentation says it this way, that his mercies are renewed fresh every single morning. We should be excited about that, that God is no longer calculating your debt every single day. But he's giving you fresh mercy every single day that you wake up. But not only that, but he's no longer calculating our debt to him. Instead, he's actively giving more. The precious gift of salvation. So instead of God saying, let me, let me figure out, tally their total of what they did wrong yesterday, and I'm going to look at this, and I'm going to make sure that I get it all down to the dime, God says, instead of calculating it, I'm just going to give them more, the gift of salvation. So when God says, I could tally against them, he says, instead of doing that, I'm going to just keep giving. Aren't you glad that God continues to keep giving? Giving and giving and giving. And the least you can do is just share and share and share. And even if, even if people don't respond immediately, be patient and keep sharing. Be patient and keep sharing. So the last thing I need to share with you is just simply this. He's, he's no longer counting or tallying. Our sins, that word sins in the Greek is, a, is just the Greek word uh, uh, paraptomai, which simply suggests a fall, a falling, or a failing, or to fall by the wayside. And so Paul uses this Greek word to express anything that deviates from God's ways, he's no longer counting. Y'all see that? So what that suggests is, is that God, through the death of Jesus, he was, he is, and he continues to bring back all people who have fallen. Everybody who has made a mistake, God is bringing them back and trying to bring them back to himself. So although we were enemies of God, God Christ reached out to us, saving us from certain destruction. We were on the way, and Jesus reached out and said, before you get there, let me offer you something. I want to offer you salvation. And everybody who's a baptized believer in the body of Christ, you accepted that. And now it's our turn to turn around and say, now, who do I know who has not accepted this invitation, and I'm going to offer it to them? I'm going to offer it to them. But here's even the good part. He washed us in order that we may approach God with clean hearts. Not only did he save us, but he washed us. So that when we approach God, 
God sees us as being pure. Why won't you go share that with your friends? Why won't you go share that with your family? Yeah, I know the friend and family dynamic is a difficult one to navigate because we all get on each other's nerves. I get that. But people still deserve to know that God is in the saving and washing business. They still deserve that. No matter how much they get on your nerves, they still deserve to know that God is in the saving and the washing context. So here's the last thing I need to give you, and then we'll go home. It's very simple. When you understand where you come from, so before you start looking at where they are and what they doing and why they doing what they doing, no, remember where you were first. When you understand where you come from, You can accept the idea that people can change and grow beyond their past mistakes just like you did. But it starts with remembering where you were. Before you look down because you're no longer there, remember where you were first. And then you can say, it did take me a little time to get through this and to get through this and to get through that. And that's okay because because I've accepted God, he's walking with me so that I can get past this and get past this and get... The one thing you ought not do in evangelism when you're sharing the good news is turn the good news into condemnation. Don't do that. Because if the good news... Is condemnation, if the good news is turned into condemnation, it's no longer good. But it's something that people have to try to work through to get over. And one of the things that we've done as a kingdom of people is we have struggled with leaving. We should not have to scare people to God. Does that make sense? We no longer should have to scare people to God. But the one thing that we, sh- we can do is show them about how great and how good and how merciful and how gracious God is. And we should be able to usher them to God. No longer scaring them. Because I'm going to tell you something. There's a generation coming now. <laughs> They're already here. Let me say that. They're already here. And they are my kids and the generation above them, they are not scared of anything. You tell them something hot, they say, okay, and what they do, I'm gonna go test it anyway. You tell them, oh, don't do that because that's gonna be harmful to you, okay, and what do they do? They gonna do it anyway. But if you tell them, you know what, there is some good things that come out about that, that good things that are happening, and let me tell you about them. They're all ears because they only understand good, but when they hear, oh, something negative, what do they do? Okay, and I'm going to go try it anyway. There's a generation coming now that's not going to be afraid of condemnation, but they will listen to the good news. And, and no matter whether you try to overemphasize whatever you want to do, let me tell you something. Good news is better than trying to scare someone. It's better than that. Why tell them about the negative when the positive is so good? The positive is too good. It's too good. It's too good. And if you remember where you were at one point in time, you're happy that the person who came and evangelized to you said, look, let me tell you about who this God is. Let me tell you about who this God is that's changed my life. Some of us, me included, I was scared into God. They said, if you died today, you're going to hell if you're not baptized in the church. And I said, oh, I can't be that person. Get me in that water. But the gospel is too good for us to scare people into it. The gospel is too good. So let's, like, let's leave it that way. Can we do that? Can we leave it that way? Let's let the Bible do the speaking. Let's let the Bible show people how to get to God. And let's leave the rest up to God. How about that? Can we do that? All right. Stand, stand where you are. Stand, stand, stand to your feet where you're sitting. Stand to your feet where you're sitting. We're going to sing a song now. If you need to come to God, I'm not trying to scare you into it. I'm trying to encourage you that life with God is better than life without God. It's better. 
And if you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and your Savior today, we're ready. The elders are already coming down. I didn't even have the problem. They're already here. So if you're ready, we're ready. If you need prayer, if you need prayer, let's pray for you. If you need prayer, let's pray for you. We're ready to pray for you if you're ready. Why don't